Okay, good morning everybody. Good morning. morning, thanks for being here. So my name is Paul Delora. I lead Carbon's sales and customer support and training organization. And I'm gonna talk about the, the journey that Carbon is on and that we're on with many of you to really help change how companies design, engineer, make, and distribute their products. And now this, this journey that we're on is taking place in the context of a much broader digital revolution. It's hard to imagine an aspect of our lives that hasn't been dramatically impacted over the last 20 plus years by changes that brought about by the digital revolution. Everything from the way that we communicate to the way that we consume, to the way that we collect information, even the way that I got to the airport yesterday, has all been changed quite dramatically by the digital revolution. But when we think about manufacturing, we think there's still tremendous opportunity to apply digital concepts and to have this digital revolution impact manufacturing as well. Because when we look at manufacturing, we see that almost all of the manufacturing starts and ends in the physical world. And there's tremendous opportunity to change this. And that really hasn't changed in decades, and neither has the, the fundamental steps of development. If we think about a development cycle, it includes a design or idea stage, a prototyping stage, then generally a tooling stage, and ultimately a manufacturing stage that takes place on a different set of tools than was used during the prototyping phase. And we think there's tremendous opportunity to change this. And 3D printing has held the promise of this. That's why 3D printing and additive manufacturing has attracted a lot of attention over the years, is because 3D printing holds the promise of changing this and bringing incremental value with things like on-demand production or on-demand inventory, and local production for local markets, even things like brand new geometries that couldn't be produced any other way have all been theoretically possible as a result of additive manufacturing. But when we look at true production and what's taking place in production with additive manufacturing, with a few incredibly notable exceptions, very little is being produced at a production scale using 3D printing technologies. And we think there's a tremendous opportunity here. And now why is this? Well, for the most part, it's because the processes, the materials that have existed up till now haven't allowed for production. So the materials that have existed haven't been suitable for production. The printing process has taken too long, longer than production cycles might want. And the economics just haven't worked when compared against manufacturing techniques that have been refined for decades and are incredibly efficient. And so the economics of switching away from other manufacturing techniques just haven't been met by additive manufacturing. And there's been a ton of innovation on the digital side of things. So over the last 20, 30 years, in the world of digital design, there have been huge innovations that, we ta that have taken place. If we go back to, say, the, the Boeing 777 aircraft, the first, first all-digitally designed aircraft, with a huge amount of knowledge built into the digital model, and then the standardization and widespread adoption of tools like SolidWorks and Autodesk, and other tools that have really helped unleash the creativity of engineers, then those, that creativity has been applied in the sense of prototyping using additive manufacturing techniques, but as soon as we try to move beyond prototyping into production, that innovation gets lost, that digital thread gets cut because we have to go and use a different set of tools for production than we could use during the prototyping stage. Now we think there's an opportunity to change this and because of our fundamental advancements that I'll describe momentarily, we think there's an opportunity to really bring digital to manufacturing and to change how the development processes work, change how people design, engineer, make, and distribute their goods. And like all digital revolutions, there's an opportunity to cut steps out, to disintermediate. Rather than having to go through those four steps that I described earlier, it's possible to go, to, to go straight from a digital design environment where there's a huge amount of iteration and innovation directly to a production environment. And while maintaining that, that high level of iteration and the things that we, we were doing in a prototyping stage, it's not that we're stopping that, it's just that we can do that much more quickly and do that directly on the means of production. And so if you come by our booth this week, you'll see this tagline of stop prototyping and start producing. And we recognize this is a little provocative, especially in a setting like this, which is historically focused on prototyping technologies. Uh, and we don't mean to imply that the value of prototyping has is, is gone away. What we're stating here is that there's an opportunity to be able to do all that iteration, do the design work, all that iteration on the same tools that you're going to be using for production. If you're iterating on a, a set of tools and you're fabricating on a set of tools that you cannot take ultimately to production, we call that prototyping. 
But if you're able to do those iterations and do that fabrication on the same set of tools that you're going to use for production, we call that production. And that gives you the ability to quickly ramp up production once all of your iterations are complete. And to continue to tweak them over time. And can you make improvements and iterations over time? And so we call that stop iterating and start producing. Now, if you also come by our booth, you're going to see this shoe. And we're very pleased to be able to talk about this publicly now. It's something we've been working on for, for quite some time. Uh, it's a partnership with Adidas uh, around a shoe called the Futurecraft 4D shoe. And this is a representation of many of the concepts that I just described earlier. So I'm going to show a video now that Adidas put together that describes the program and the philosophy and the approach that they're bringing to this program, which is consistent with what I just described earlier. started with the idea of Futurecraft, it was to sort of guide us, to set us on a path. It's a mindset and it's a philosophy to try things. We're always bringing in new influences, new ideas, new collaborations. 3D printing, for example, was one of these new technologies that really had unlimited possibilities. You know, the initial problem was, okay, can we actually make a running shoe out of 3D printed material that really works and works well. So when we started thinking about doing 3D printing, we wanted to use liquids, because liquids give you the most flexibility in material design. I think of light as a chisel. Light triggers the solidification of the liquid, but oxygen inhibits it. That allows us to have the object grow. What's really interesting about this collaboration with carbon is we're seeing a convergence of a completely new manufacturing technology. We're going to scale it with the best industrial partner in the business. We're able to deliver tens of thousands mm -hmm. and move into hundreds of thousands and into the tens of millions. You know, that's clear in front of us. We have this amazing opportunity to innovate the printing process, the liquid rising. And growing in that context can give you new design thoughts you've never had before and new performance capabilities that wouldn't mm -hmm. be possible by traditional manufacturing. This three-dimensional mesh structure, it's a lattice, it's a matrix, it's a web of individual elements. Each one of those little elements is tuned specifically for a purpose. These lattice structures behave quite differently mm -hmm. than anything we've dealt with before. They're much different than foams. Now we have every individual area of the shoe to work with, which is a completely new horizon for us and a new venture. If you really want to make a shoe that's a size nine, that same shoe for someone who's 180 pounds versus 100 pounds has got to be different. We can go in within every single cell and engineer that exact cell to do exactly what the consumer needs it to do just for them. That's fascinating. That's going to change uh, how we create products and certainly how consumers experience products. And I think that's how we see something like Futurecraft 4D playing into the life of an athlete. I would say this is just the very beginning and you know that sounds silly and cliche but and who knows, man? I don't, I, I don't know what's next, and that's what's great about going to work every day. So our partnership with Adidas, our partnership with Adidas represents what is by far the highest volume of production of end use parts coming from an additive technology and we're really excited about that. So we're going to be doing 5,000 units by the end of this year, 100,000 by the end of next year and as you heard in the video with clear line of sight to millions and tens of millions after that. So it's validation that the technology is suitable for production and that's something that's really exciting for us. Now, it's not the only aspect of the story, though, that we think is interesting. There are other key things, including the fact that the performance that they're able to achieve with a lattice elastomer structure is unlike the performance of anything that they've been able to achieve before. This midsole here, which I can show you after and you can also see in our booth, is a highly engineered midsole that's based on decades of athlete performance data that Adidas has been collecting. And they've been working on what would be an optimum design for, in this case, a runner, 
based on the preferences of the runners that they work with. And you'll see that the lattice structure is very different in the heel than it is in the toe, and it is very different in the middle part of the midsole. And these are, this is all tuned and optimized for what they want to be the optimum performance. And the ultimate intent is that there will be mass customization, mass personalization of this, so that they'll be able to scan the, your foot in the way that you run or walk and design automatically an optimized midsole that would then be printed and produced just for you. And this is all within grasp now, and we're, we're going to be coming out with the first shoes later this year in a commercial setting. So that's really exciting for us. Another aspect of, this, of the program, though, that's quite interesting is the number of changes, the number of iterations that we've been able to go through. So in a normal shoe development cycle, they might go through four or five different designs of a midsole. We've been able to go through 50 in a six-month period of time. We've gone through over 150 different material iterations, over 200 different iterations of the printing process, the manufacturing process, in order to tune and optimize it. And we make all those changes and then print and test. We iterate, we print, we test, and we just repeat that over and over and over again until we get to the point where we're comfortable, and then we begin ramping up production. And we're going to continue to be able to make those changes going forward as we continue to find breakthroughs in materials and design, and even have designs that are optimized for each of us. So it's a great testament to the flexibility and the design freedom that comes with additive and the ability to incorporate those de designs into a production process very, very quickly. And the idea that this is a change really for Adidas is reflected in the quote right here. Uh, it's a, a quote from an executive board member from Adidas, and he, he says, with digital light synthesis, we venture beyond limitations of the past, unlocking a new era in design and manufacturing, one driven by athlete data and agile manufacturing processes. So this is an entirely new opportunity for Adidas and for the industry as a whole to take advantage of, of additive. So it's something we're quite excited about and happy to talk with you more about uh, this week. Now let me step back a little bit and talk to you more about Carbon, for those who may not be as familiar with us. So Carbon was founded in 2013, and for the first couple of years, we were fairly quiet. In March of 2015, we launched ourselves on the cover of the journal Science, which talked about the technology and the advancements that we made in technology, uh, as well as on the stages of TED, where we had the harrowing experience of printing live in front of the, the TED audience in a video that's now been viewed over two and a half million times. It's about a year after that that we released our first printer, our M1 printer, which you can see over in the booth. And since that time, we've now had a lot of adoption of our printer and the materials that we launched last year. And we have customers who have printed now over 25,000 prints using our printers over the course of last year. And we learned so much from our customers in the last year. And one of the key things that we learned is that our customers were really interested in taking this technology into production. So many of them start with ideas of using it for prototyping and functional prototyping to be able to extend beyond perhaps what they could do in the past with prototyping. But once they see the materials, once they see the speed of printing and the opportunity for production, we begin to work on production applications with them. And so we've had to change how we think about our offering as well. And earlier this year, we launched what we call our Speed Cell, which is a collection of a printer, a bigger printer, what we call our M2 printer, as well as an automated part washer that I'll describe later on, that really helps bring more automation to an entire manufacturing workflow. Because we realize that manufacturing has to be beyond just the printing process, and we need to consider the entire workflow and have good automated solutions for that. So that's what we call our Speed Cell. We also uh, had the perhaps more harrowing experience of printing live on the Today Show when we printed our midsole uh, live on the Today Show. That was uh, just early last month. Uh, and we've, had, we've begun now with international expansion, and particularly with customers who have, who have asked us to go overseas in order to support them overseas, and we're beginning to work more in Europe and in Asia. So what is the innovation? What is the technology behind all this? Well, it's called digital light synthesis, and it really consists of two main things. It consists of our printing process, what that we call CLIP, which stands for Continuous Liquid Interface Production, and our materials, programmable liquid resins, that we use to tune and get the material properties and behaviors that we need for our production applications. So our printing process, our CLIP process, uh, I'll show it to you momentarily, but it is a, a very fast and gentle process that allows for us to print parts that have good surface finish and resolution. Uh, and because it's a fast printing process, we're able to use and access a set of chemistries that are reactive chemistries that allow us to use not only light in order to set the shape, 
but also heat in order to unlock the, the mechanical properties that are needed for true functional parts. So we use our clip, our clip printing process in order to set the shape of what's printed and we use heat in order to unlock the mechanical properties and we're able to get a combination of both good surface finish and resolution as well as strong mechanical properties uh, that we're able then to, to use for true functional parts. And our parts are also isotropic and can be used for, for real engineering and production purposes. So our clip process, I'll, I'll explain this a little bit further here. What you're going to see on the left hand side is our printing process taking place. You're going to see a build platform that lowers into a pool of liquid resin. That liquid resin is held in a cassette and at the bottom of the cassette is a window. That window lets light through and it also lets oxygen through. The light is coming from a light engine that's essentially playing a movie of your part, a movie of the part that we want to have printed. And you're going to see that green outline there change over time. That green outline that's changing represents the image of the part that's being solidified because as the light comes through, it hardens or solidifies that liquid resin. Now, that, that window also allows oxygen through. And this is important because oxygen works in polar opposite to light. So light hardens or cures the resin. Oxygen prevents that curing. It inhibits the polymerization just enough so that it doesn't stick to the top of the window. If it were to stick to the top of the window, there would need to be a mechanical process that, say, scraped off the part from the top of the window, raised it up, applied fresh resin, and repeated that over and over again, which would create layers. So we're able to print in the fashion that you just saw in a layerless way. So our parts do not have any layers inside of it. Now, if we look at that, a bit more closely. This is a process called optical coherence tomography. It's like ultrasound imaging but using light. And we added a, a filler into the resin so that you, it's a contrast agent so you could see what's happening. And you can see there's a part in the middle that's being pulled up. This is being solidified or printed. On the outside we have fresh resin that flows into an area that we call the dead zone. And the dead zone is this area where oxygen is present just enough to prevent the polymerization. So we maintain a continuous liquid interface at the top of the window and that continuous liquid interface allows us to print in a continuous fashion and to print without layers. Printing without layers is important because that gives us isotropic parts. It gives us parts that don't have any layers inside of them. If you were to cleave one of our parts, you'll see on the right hand side, it's completely monolithic. So all the way through it's solid. If you were to cleave a part printed with, with traditional additive manufacturing processes, that's what it looks like on the left hand side. And you can see those visible layer lines. Each of those layer lines represents an opportunity for structural weakness and in some cases surface finish that uh, is suboptimal as well. And the parts are not isotropic and it can vary, the strength varies based on the orientation that you use for printing. Unlike our process where the strength is the same regardless of the orientation used for printing. So our printing process is really one great breakthrough that allows for us to print parts that are of this, of this quality. Now our materials, our programmable liquid resins. I mentioned earlier that our resins are programmable in the sense that they're activated both by light as well as by heat. So light is during the printing process, the clip printing process. That's how we set the shape. But our liquid resins are reactive resins that allow for us to also take advantage of heat activated chemistries. And those, ch those chemistries cross-link. So the, the light activated chemistries and the heat activated chemistries can cross-link and form incredibly strong bonds. And we're able to, to produce, oops, Got ahead of myself there, sorry. We're able to create materials now uh, that, are, that are incredibly strong, much stronger than, than would be possible if we were only using light alone. And we're able to tune that. We're able to tune how much is light activated, how much is heat activated in order to get the properties that we want. And so as I described earlier with the Adidas program, we went through over 150 different material iterations. Those were all tunes and tuning and adjustments that we made to the material in order to get the outcome that we wanted from a performance material. So we have six families of materials today, which you can see over in our, in our booth. Uh, the six families include a rigid polyurethane, which behaves very much like an injection molded ABS material. It's a tough material, it's abrasion resistant, it's stiff. We have a flexible polyurethane that behaves very much like a polypropylene. It's much more flexible uh, than an, a rigid polyurethane. And our elastomeric polyurethane is the, the parent of what you see with the Adidas resin. So the Adidas resin is a derivative of this family of resins, uh, and it's a rubber type material. Our cyanide ester material is a high temp material that performs very much like a 15% glass filled nylon. And our epoxy material is a material that performs a lot like a 20% glass filled PBT, uh, which is very good for when you need good temperature resistance, but also a strong material uh, and a material that's going to be quite accurate for the printing process. 
And then we have a urethane methacrylate family of materials that's used really for those upfront iterations. And this is a, a material that only requires light to cure. There's no thermal curing step involved with these materials. And so it's great when you want to do those upfront form or fit checks, but you don't need to yet check the function of the part. For the function of the part, that's when the other materials come into play. And so we're able to produce these, these great materials that have, like our cyanide ester, a heat deflection temperature of 230 degrees Celsius. Uh, our elastomeric polyurethane, which in this form here is incredibly flexible, and you get great variance just by changing the geometry. You can have, you can have uh, lattice structures that are very rigid and tough. You can have lattice elastomer structures that are very flexible, as you can see right here. Our flexible polyurethane is great for things like living hinges and snap fits. Uh, our customer, Becton Dickinson, talked about this at, at AMUG a few weeks ago, where for them, the living hinge is the holy grail of functional prototyping. They've never been able to do it before. Uh, now they're able to do a, a living hinge that can cycle 150 times before breaking. Uh, and then in the lower right, let me play this again. In the lower right, you can see our epoxy family of materials. And this is an exciting family for us because not only do we have the epoxy material that, is, that I described before that's a lot like a 20% glass-filled PBT, but it also gives us a, a lot of room for creating new materials, including a flame-resistant material. So we have under development today a material that passes the V0 rating, the UL94 V0 rating, and it's flame-resistant, uh, and it gives us a lot of opportunity for further growth with that material family. So how are other customers using this besides Adidas? Well, one example that we're really excited about is with BMW. So BMW has a ride sharing program in Germany where they have Mini Coopers. And they wanted to have Mini Coopers that were personalized so they could have a unique badge, a unique way of identifying each of the vehicles that are part of this ride sharing program so that a driver could go up and be told that today they're driving a vehicle named John, as is shown here. And a different vehicle would have a different name. And so we worked with them to print these side scuttles, these exterior badges, that are unique for each of the vehicles. Uh, and so that each vehicle has a different name. We printed those side scuttles out of our rigid polyurethane material. They've been on vehicles now for almost a year and a half, driving through the winter and the summer and the various seasons in Germany, uh, and dealing with all the road debris that comes from being driven. And they've held up without any field failures, and, the, and have also held up in terms of the weathering and the color fast, fastness. And it's a program that we intend to expand over time. And you can see this is a step towards mass personalization, the ability to really customize all products, all parts, to be what an end customer might want. Another great example is with Oracle. Uh, Oracle it has their server division, which makes high-performance computing environments, and they needed a way to be able to make those little brackets about the size of a thumb to hold boards inside of their servers. And they needed to be able to, to produce 10,000 of these in only two days and have them go on a series of servers that we're gonna be ramping up for production as they go through a validation cycle. And they were able to print these, we were able to print these, 10,000 in two days, all with the, with the quality that they needed, the surface finish that they needed in order to perform. Uh, and as you can see here from Craig Steven, the Senior Vice President of uh, Engineering, he, he says, working with Carbon extended our prototyping into production quantities and qualities. We received structural parts when we needed them and in volumes to get the job done. And this was a quick print, as I said, just a couple days to get the volumes that they needed. Another example that we're excited about and that was talked about at, uh, at the AMUG conference a couple of weeks ago is with our customer Caterpillar. Uh, so Caterpillar is using, among other things, our elastomeric polyurethane material in order to be able to produce grommets. Produce grommets for aftermarket. So they have to maintain things like this bulldozer, equipment like this bulldozer, out in the field for decades. And maintaining spare parts inventory is no small feat. And you can imagine a small grommet like that it doesn't need to be replaced very often, but maintaining a supplier base for those kinds of grommets is, is fairly challenging. So the original suppliers might have gone out of business, the original suppliers might not want to produce them anymore without very large minimum order quantities. And so Caterpillar worked in order to qualify our EPU material, our elastoperic polyurethane material, and proved that it, it met the performance requirements that they had for these grommets. And so now what they do is they just print these grommets on demand. Anytime a dealer or a customer needs a new grommet, they print these in Peoria and send them out. They don't maintain any inventory. They just print them and distribute them whenever, that they, need, whenever they need them. So it's a great example of on-demand inventory and being able to produce for demand instead of having to maintain huge, 
huge warehouses full of inventory that may never get consumed and may ultimately be thrown away. And this is just beginning, so they reported that they've uh, found just in the last six months four grommets like this, uh, and the value of this has already paid for, paid for the value of the machine. So I mentioned earlier that we've, we've been pulled by our customers. It's been really exciting to see how we've been pulled by our customers into these production examples. And one of the things that we realize that we need for production is bigger and bigger printers. And for a variety of reasons, including the ability to be able to print bigger parts, larger parts, uh, but also for throughput purposes. Because if we have a bigger printer, we can fit more small parts on them, and that increases the, the productivity. So we came out with a little over a month ago the M2 printer, which has twice the build volume of the M1, yet maintains all the same parameters, the same resolution, the same speed. Uh, everything else is the same compared to the M1. Even the form factor, the size of the machine is the same, except for the build platform, the build volume, which is twice the size of the M1. So it's something that, um, that we're very excited about. We announced it a couple weeks ago. We're going to be launching it uh, middle of this year and, uh, and sending it out to customers. And it's part of, though, a speed cell that includes an automated part washer. Because for, for manufacturing, we need to be able to look at and consider how best to automate and streamline the entire workflow. And our workflow includes not only the printing process, but also washing of the parts, because there's resin on the parts that needs to be washed off, and then a thermal cure or a baking process. And so we've taken the step of automating the wash process by releasing the smart part washer, which takes the build platform off of the printer, puts it into the automated part washer, automatically detects the part that was printed and the material that was used, and then optimizes the wash based on those factors, on the geometry as well as the material that's used to determine the right amount of time to wash it, the right intensity to use, how much agitation to, to use during the washing process, so you get a consistent, reliable, successful washing process. There are a number of benefits to this, including yield, because the, each of the wash processes is going to be standardized and unique, so the yield is improved, as well as much less labor, much less time required in order to, in order to wash parts. So this is something that we're really excited about. And the way that our customers are, are using our technology, we're finding is grouped into design environments and production environments. So we have what we call the design speed cell, which is essentially a collection of one or two printers and a part washer. And these are typically at design or engineering environments. It's where people are doing rapid iterations on the design. Maybe they're tuning and working on the production process as well until they feel comfortable with it and then move that over to a production environment where there's a larger collection of printers and part washers. And those production environments are where the volume production may, may take place. And those production environments can be anywhere around the world. They can be inside or outside the same company that's doing the design work. It could be at a contract manufacturer. And it gives a, a really a new degree of freedom and possibility for ramping up and down production. So once design iterations are complete, it can be pushed over to a production environment and then ramp up or down production based on demand. And the only thing that's being transferred around are digital files. No tooling, no lead times for tooling, none of that. Just transferring over digital files and the printing process takes place. And so we're grouping our offerings in this way in what we call a design speed cell and a production speed cell in order to allow for this degree, this, this kind of flexibility that our customers are asking for. And a really important concept of all of this is maintaining a digital thread. So we talked earlier about the, uh, the opportunity for digital in manufacturing and digital requires data. And because this entire process is data driven, we're able to collect, to produce, collect and manage all the data associated with the printing process. So if you look at the bottom of, of one of the midsoles, you're going to find a unique number, a unique identifier. That serial number tracks back to the time that that, part was, that midsole was printed, the resin that was used, the conditions associated with the printing process, what the wash process was like. All that can be tied back to the original design file, like the, the digital model. And so you have a full digital thread that you're able to carry from design all the way into production. We call that part provenance, meaning the, the origin of the part. We're able to track and maintain all that data associated with that part uh, in order to be able to ensure the part quality and also the authenticity of the part. So it gives you as manufacturers the ability to, to, to stamp and designate what are official parts that you make and ensure the right levels of quality on them. So that's a, a bit of an introduction to carbon. 
Uh, we're going to be here all week. We're at booth 1737. And we also have two more presentations taking place. So Steve Pollack is going to be talking tomorrow at 120 in the same location about reinventing the possibilities in the manufacturing of medical device. And then Matt Menyo is going to be talking about our materials, our current materials and our materials roadmap on Thursday at 1220 also here. So we really look forward to having more conversations with you, uh, have you attending these other presentations and learning from you this week about what's most important for you. It's learning from you is what sets our roadmap and where we go in the future. So uh, we're very happy to, to be here and to be able to talk with you. We're now able to open it up for questions. So there's a microphone in the back that's gonna be passed around. So uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand and we'll get the microphone to you. Yeah. Check, 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 check. Good morning. Good morning. So as a uh, concept, will a consumer be able to go to a retail center, scan their foot, process the order, and then receive it? What's the lead time? Well, that, though, that has not been finalized yet. That's the ultimate intent. And you saw in the video from Adidas the idea of scanners on the, on the floor that people would run over and that would be able to get an imprint of, of the, the, the shoe, the foot, uh, so they could put, produce the, the digital model. So those are things that are part of the roadmap. It's not the immediate go-to-market. The immediate go-to-market is to have more standard f uh, shoe offerings that are produced based on standard sizes and then different different uh, lattice structures based on different sports. So we'll start with running and then different sports will have different profiles of, of lattices. But the ultimate intent is to do just what you described. So you go five to, store, to 10 years? Pardon me? Five to 10 years? Uh, we think it can be faster than that. Within yeah. the one to five? Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, it's really exciting. The question up here? The flush material that you're using on your parts, does it have to be uh, optimized for the materials? Is there a range of materials that can be used for it? For, for uh, which part, I'm sorry? For, for, for the, the flush material that you're using oh, to... Uh, to wash? To wash, yes. Yeah, I'm sorry I didn't mention that. So the wash material that we use is something called Vertrell. That's the most common that we're going to use. It's a non-flammable solvent that works inside of our part washer and can be reused and recycled. So there's a, distil a distillation process as well. Is there a family that that can work with and is there other family or other parts of the family that it won't and do machines have to be selective for what is going to be washed? For, uh, so the short answer is that's an application, that is a, a a solvent that is going to work with almost all of our resins. There will be one resin that we're still that's still in development where we think we're going to need a different solvent, and so you'd need to flush that out or have two different part washers. Yeah, and that might change over time as we come out with new materials. We might find that there are different, more optimal solvents that we would need to incorporate, and then figure out the right way to to um, use those solvents and replace them from machine to machine. Yeah, you're welcome. Good question. Yeah, uh, do you see uh, degradable resins in your future? Degradable or resins biodegradable. in our, yeah. biodegradable resins yeah. in our future? That's a good question for uh, Matt, who's going to be speaking on Thursday. So our, we use thermoset materials. So they're not, uh, they, they cannot be melted down like a thermoplastic, they're thermosets. But we can um, uh, grind them down and reuse them for, for other purposes. Yeah. Uh, I guess my question is also for Matt and eventually <laughs> get to is, uh, do you see a time frame when you may be able to support a color palette? Uh, the, the so the question, I'll, I'll take that one. The question is, do we see a time frame when we could have a color palette? And I should have mentioned this, but our urethane methacrylate resins have a full color palette today. So you can select any color and print with those colors. It comes with CMYK, and you can do color mixing uh, to select whatever color that you might want. Our other materials have standard colors at the moment, either black or in the case of cyanide ester, it's kind of an amber color. Uh, w our materials, though, are, are it, they are possible to take color. So this here, you can see, is not black. Uh, and we came up with this linen green color to, for, based on the Adidas specifications. It's just a matter of, of choosing the color to add and then working on the right formulation. So they can all take color. We've chosen to, we've chosen to go to market today with black because that's the most common request that we have. Just uh, 
clarify. So the when when you say that there's a color you can choose, it's only sing, still one color, right? It's not like a multi color, uh, multi color. Yeah. So we're printing with with one material at a time. That one material has a single color. We, you can do things, and we'll sometimes experiment with the swirling of colors, mm -hmm. uh, especially with our with our urethane methacrylate resins. You can take multiple colors, mix them together, even create a swirl. But that's that's uh, not necessarily a what you would do in production. So y in your machine. Uh, there, so far, there's only one color that you can do. It's like not stratasys, you can do multi-colors. That, that's correct. So okay. we're printing with one material and one color at a I time. Uh, I came in late, so I, I'm curious if your machine can do porcelain now? Can do porcelain? Uh -huh. What do you mean by porcelain? Like do you... Uh, oh, porcelain. porcelain. Oh, I'm Por sorry. No, we do not have a, a porcelain material right now. Uh, do, yeah. do you have plans? Yeah, we, we, we think that uh, it's, it's a possible material for us. It's not out of... We, there are no technical limitations. It's just not something that we've focused on. Okay. And ceramics okay. and porcelains and things. Yeah. Speak it. That was about the same question I had. Uh, just curious if, if the opportunity is ever going to come where you could incorporate multiple materials into one print, if that's a focus of yours or a limitation. We, we have experimented with that, and we know that it is possible, but it's not something that we've really chosen to pursue. What we have pursued, though, and something that is, is quite exciting for us, is the ability to print two different materials and then during the bake process to have them bond during the bake process. If you fixture them together or put them together next to each other, then you actually get cross-linking between the chemistry and you get an incredibly strong bond. So we, when you get a, a, a failure, and when you test and try to pull it apart, you get, you get a cohesive failure, not an adhesive failure. So it doesn't fail at the point where you've done the, the intersection. Instead, it fails at the weak point of, of the material. So we're seeing great things. It's kind of like an overmolding process, uh, and we're seeing really great applications, especially for doing things like take an elastomeric material and surround a rigid polyurethane material to create a handle or a grip. That's something where we're seeing a lot of interest right now. So that's been, that's been fun to see. Yeah, there's a question up here. How, uh, how resistant to oxidation, moisture, and UV yeah. effects are the materials? Because I'd imagine the midsole get exposed to a all of those. Absolutely, yeah. So we had to meet all, all sorts of standards for moisture absorption and UV stability in order to be able to, to meet the needs of of Adidas for the midsole. Different industries have different requirements and different materials have different requirements. Um, but in general, the materials don't fade under light. They're, they're quite stable, uh, com especially when compared with, say, other SLA resins. Uh, but if you're, if you're looking at, say, the UV stability required for automotive and being able to, to survive Florida humidity for five years, we're not quite there yet. Okay. Yeah. And, and you mentioned earlier with, uh, about post-processing, like the, the baking. Yeah. What, what goes into your typical post-process besides the washing? So, the, yeah, so after the, the printing process, there's a washing process, which I described. And then it's a matter of putting the part into an oven. It's a, it's a programmable oven. And there are different bake schedules for different materials. But the most common one is about a, a four-hour bake at 120 degrees Celsius. Is that also a product that you guys sell? We, yeah, we, we don't make that ourselves, but we offer it to our customers as part of an accessories package. Okay. And it's been, it's been um, kind of tuned for our process. It has the right programs that, that you need to, to bake and cure our materials. Okay, thanks. Uh, you're welcome. So, yeah. So just, no, could pass this down, please? So just to be clear on that, what I think we're seeing is that you have, you're, using the light and the, you're using the light to uh, generate a green part and then you're firing it to the uh, thermoset that you... Exactly. Okay. Yep. yep. Thank you. Yeah, well, then we'll pass back to you. Okay. Um, could you describe the, the main difference uh, from, uh, let's say, SLA, uh, so serial lithography system, this is uh, also a similar system? Mm -hmm. uh, what's the main difference or uh, what makes you different? Yeah, the, the question was, what's the main difference with a, yeah. with a traditional SLA process? Yeah. And there are, there are a few. One is the ability to print parts that are isotropic and that are layerless. So our printing process is layerless. That's a key difference. Another key difference is the range of materials that we're able to use in order to produce parts that have typically much much higher, much stronger materials uh, because of the, the uh, dual cure chemistry that we're able to use. Uh, it's yeah, so, so we're able to get, so yeah. SLA is wonderful, especially for producing parts that have great surface finish and resolution, but typically the mechanical properties are not what you might need for production or want. So we're able to combine that surface yeah. finish with, uh, with very good mechanical properties yeah. and much stronger materials.
You're welcome. And there's somebody behind you who has a question here. Pass that back, please. Uh, do you think that this clip technology has the capability to move into like garment manufacturing or like textiles? Into what? I'm sorry. This clip technology. Do you think that it has the capability to move into like textile development? To move uh, into textile development? Uh, like more flexible. So this is like. Oh, we'll be able to, to print a textile instead of being able to print. Yeah. A so so uh, to, to print the remaining sole of the shoe or like. Uh, oh, to, to print the upper. The, upper the, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's not something that we've we've chosen to focus on. That would likely be a, a different set of chemistries. I don't know. We'd have to I'd ask ask my friend Matt that. Uh, right. who's, who's, uh, so we'll, we can we can talk about that later. But uh, it's not been something that we've focused on. Right, okay. But what we are doing, and what's kind of interesting, is the ability to to create textures and patterns on top of fabric. Right. We can print a mold that then apply then fabric is applied against it to okay. create a texture. So uh, uh. printing on three D surfaces. You yeah. Mean? Right. Yeah. Right. Any other questions? Oh, good. So, do your material? Yes, sir. Oh, sorry, man. Sorry. Do your materials have different printing speeds? Is that based on that that size of that oxygen? Yeah, yeah. The, permeable the, window. That, that's correct. So, the the dead zone, what we call the dead zone, which is that area just on top of the window where there's a continuous liquid interface where that is maintained, and that's where fresh resin can flow in. Yes, that. The speed with which we can print different materials varies. One of the key differences is based on the viscosity of the material. So if it's a highly viscous material, if it's a material that takes a long time to flow and to flow into that area, then it's going to take longer to print. If it's a very, if it's, if it's a, a liquid resin or a resin that's not as viscous, then it can be much faster. Another key variable for, for speed is the geometry of the part. If it's a sparse part, then it can print more quickly, but if it's a very dense part with a lot of cross section, then that takes a longer time to print because again, that resin needs to flow in uh, in order to, to print that next slice. So would you consider that a sparse part? Yeah, this is pretty sparse, yeah. So we can print two of these, a pair of these, we can print in under 30 minutes. Good question. Pardon me? The question is, do we print these on the M1 or the M2? And actually, it's neither. So we, we've developed a, a custom printer for printing the midsoles that's actually bigger than the M2 uh, that is designed specifically for, for Adidas and for printing of these midsoles. But what, what that proves to us is that we can scale. We can create bigger and bigger platforms, not only the M1 and the M2, but even bigger beyond that. Are you planning that for custom orthotics? Uh, the, the question is, are we planning these for custom orthotics? Who knows what our customers are going to want to do or what Adidas is going to want to do with this, but uh, it, certainly it's possible. Yeah. Good. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming, and we'll look forward to talking to you this week. <laughs>